Well, welcome everyone to the, I guess you could call it the series finale of our study of Elijah. Really, it's a study of uh, First Kings and then a little bit of Second Kings about Elijah and the events surrounding his life. But um, I hope this uh, series of lessons have been encouraging and thought provoking. And uh, before I hand it over to Jeff, I just want to say thank you to Jeff for all the preparation and all the work that was put into this class and these videos. So um, I've certainly been in from this one-on-one -on -one session, and I hope those of you who have watched have learned along with me and have benefited from this class as well. So with that, I'll hand it over to Jeff to kind of give a little bit of a retrospective of the series today and kind of talk about what we're going to talk about today with the end of Elisha's life here on Earth. Jeff? Well, thanks, Kevin. I appreciate those kind words. And I, I do want to say thank you to you also for being willing to be a, 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 a participant and a, a captive audience uh, for this. You haven't had anybody to hide behind when I've asked questions. So I appreciate you being a, a good sport about all of this. Yeah, let, let's do take a minute to think back over the course of the previous lessons and, and some of the highlights. I think about Elijah's prayer life as a highlight. He prayed, and for three and a half years, there was no rain. He prayed, and a boy was raised from the dead. He prayed, and a sacrifice on an altar was consumed by fire from heaven. He was also faithful in carrying out the work of a prophet. That work led him to confronting two different kings of Israel, so not, not really a fun job. And in fact, he, ran, he wound up running for his life, uh, going into hiding a couple of times in what we read. At one of those points, at his lowest point, it seems like God made a uh, a, a special appearance of, of God's presence and, and talk to Elijah. And uh, God provided in other ways for Elijah over the course of these lessons. He was fed by ravens. He went to uh, stay with the widow, and they were fed by this unending jar of flour and of oil. Uh, he was fed by an angel at one point. And another thing that God provided for Elijah was a co-worker, a disciple. I would even say, I think, a friend in the person of Elisha. Elisha is going to come back into this lesson that we're just about ready uh, to start. I'm thinking back also to two particular things that we talked about in our first lesson we said in that first lesson that Elijah is just a man. He's just a guy. And we, we said that we want to be careful not to put him on a pedestal. That's particularly important when we think about his job as a, a prophet is to call people back to God. I don't think Elijah would want us to be making that big a fuss about him because he was about pointing people to God. Another thing we talked about, Kevin, in the first lesson, both you and I were reminiscing about uh, growing up as a young person, studying Elijah in Sunday school, and both of us said that the event the, from Elijah's life that we remembered the most, made the biggest impression on us, was that Elijah was taken up to heaven uh, without ever dying. So we finally come uh, to that story, and that's that's even the opening words of Second Kings chapter two, where we'll be going. Uh, but I've I've come to the conclusion after studying this that that's not really the main point of this chapter. Uh, so I'll I'll be explaining that uh, when we get a little further into this. Um, but Kevin, let's let's go ahead and and get into our lesson. Uh, so, if you could, in Second Kings chapter two, could you read verses one through eight, please? Absolutely. Again, I'll be reading from the ESV version. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal, and Elijah said to Elisha, "Please stay here." 
for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel and the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, please stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water. And the water was parted to the one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. There's several people in uh, what you just read for us. Uh, who has a revelation from God in this passage? Well, the sons of the prophets, which I believe is just a, a group of prophets affiliated with some other more prominent prophet, come to um, Elisha and say, you know, something's going to happen to your buddy Elijah here. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of doing a trick question on you, Kevin, because it really seems like everybody knows what's going to happen. I mean, would would you agree with that? Do you feel like Elijah and Elisha and then these other sons of the prophets all seem to know what's happening? No, you. I, I would agree with that, and especially even just verse one. You know, it's just kind of a matter of fact statement that now this was the time that Elijah was going to be brought up in the whirlwind. So it seems like it must just be, like you said, maybe common knowledge, but... Um, yeah, I think it's a fair trick question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's a few things that are, I would say, even puzzling about how this is written. First off, uh, that there's there's a lot of repetition in it. There's there's two sets of these prophets in in two different cities. Uh, three times Elijah says, uh, I, "I'm going to go someplace. Why don't you stay here?" and and every time he says that, Elisha says, I'm not going to leave you. And that last statement is kind of what sticks with me. The fact that these events are repeated, but Elisha says three times, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to leave you. I think, I think that's the message is his determination to stay with Elijah and, and, and the devotion that he's showing there. Uh, the the other thing is about Elijah keeps trying to leave Elisha behind. Uh, you know, I it's kind of mysterious. Uh, it's kind of speculation. But Kevin, do you have any thoughts about why Elijah might might be trying to leave Elisha behind? Well. Two things come to mind, and this is just speculation, as I don't think we know, but maybe he just wanted to be alone with his thoughts, knowing what was about to happen to him, his last moments on earth. Um, so that, that's one thing, just the, just the human aspect of, wow, something special is going to happen today, and I'm going to be gone. Then I think the other thing is that just maybe to test Elisha's devotion and to see really... Um, you know, he's shown his devotion before the way that he followed him. He said goodbye to his parents, burned the oxen and sacrificed, uh, or excuse me, burned the yoke and sacrificed the oxen. So, you know, I think that's a good track record, but maybe this was just another test to see um, what Elisha was going to do. Yeah, I think back to that event of uh, Elijah first calling Elisha also. And at that time, Elijah said, what have I done to you? What have I done? <laughs> and, and I think he he cared for Elisha and um, was perhaps wanting to spare him uh, in some way. That was another thought that I have. Uh, but 
yeah, I mean, we we don't we don't really know uh, why, but what for whatever reason it was, Elisha is, is sticking to him and and being right there with him. A couple of comments about these locations that are mentioned. Uh, there's three cities: uh, Gilgal, Bethel, and Jericho. All of them have some negative associations in the Old Testament. Uh, Bethel, in particular, earlier in First Kings, that's the site of when the split happened between the northern and the southern kingdom, and the first king, Jeroboam, introduced idolatry into the northern kingdom of Israel. That was at Bethel that he built those golden calves and, and sacrificed to them there. And Gilgal is close by. Uh, there's there's a, a verse in Amos, Amos 4.4, 4, that talks about Gilgal and Bethel and kind of connects both of them in being sinful places. And Jericho, we also saw in our very first lesson, Joshua had commanded that Jericho never be rebuilt. And during this time, uh, they, they wound up rebuilding Jericho. So we, we should kind of have some negative feelings uh, about those cities. Uh, and then the other location that comes up is the river, the River Jordan. They come to the river, and how do they get across it? Well, it's quite miraculous. Uh, Elijah rolls off his cloak, I guess you could say. He, he makes his makeshift staff, <laughs> strikes the water, and they're able to cross. Right. We, we've we seen this before in the Old Testament, haven't we? I mean, your, your reference to a staff, what are you thinking of, Kevin? Uh, Moses imparting the Red Sea for the Israelites to cross. Yes, yes. That's in Exodus chapter 14. And there's one other miraculous crossing of water that has happened even, even right here at this location, at the, at the River Jordan uh, next to Jericho when Joshua was leading the Israelites um, into the Promised Land, and they were about to attack uh, Jericho. So this is kind of uh, treading that same path. And so it's neat to see um, those, those parallels. In our previous lesson, we were talking about types and the idea that a type is a prophetic symbol. We were looking forward from Elijah to John the Baptist, we were looking forward from the pair of Elijah and Elisha to John the Baptist and Jesus. And in, in our last lesson, we saw some parallels and we said, okay, we're going to see one more set of parallels, but this one is looking backward uh, to Moses and Joshua. So just a few of the parallels. Of course, we know both Moses and Elijah had this conversation with God on Mount Horeb that was in our lesson four. We talked about that. We talked about how the name Elisha and Jesus are essentially the same name uh, that God saves. Joshua is also the same name. Uh, the Hebrew would be Yeshua, and because the Old Testament is in Hebrew, that comes into English as a word that sounds almost the same, Joshua, but because the New Testament comes to us through Greek, instead of calling Jesus Joshua, we call him Jesus. Uh, but, but essentially, Joshua, Elisha, and Jesus, the meaning of the name is God saves or Yahweh saves. Uh, we, we talked about the crossing the Jordan and, you know, where they are going on the other side, the far side of the Jordan, where 
what's going to happen next is Elijah is going to be caught up to heaven. We, we read that in verse one. And, and that's also the place where Moses died. God showed him the promised land uh, uh, across the river, but Moses didn't enter the promised land. Uh, so we're back to we're going back to the place uh, where Moses died. And there's there's this repetition of the theme of slavery, both pers personal human bondage and then spiritual bondage to the slavery of sin. That's part of the whole story of the Bible, and, and it's really borne out in these three pairs of people. So Moses and Joshua brought the Israelites out of Egypt, out of their slavery in Egypt, brought them into the promised land. Elijah and Elisha had this ministry to preserving the faithful remnant and calling people uh, into obedience, calling people back to God, calling people to repentance. And then John the Baptist and Jesus were also calling people to repentance. And Jesus provided a permanent solution to our spiritual slavery uh, to sin. So the, these three pairs of people have these similarities, and they're deeply connected to the the message of salvation that's the core message that's the core story that runs through all of the bible i think that's pretty neat so let's let's continue uh with reading the next few verses kevin if you could please read verses 9 through 12. when they had crossed elijah said to elisha ask what i shall do for you before i am taken from you and Elisha said, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. This, this statement that Elisha makes about the chariots of Israel, the horsemen, the horses of Israel, I, I've always kind of connected that to uh, you know how Elijah is being taken up to heaven, but in the courses of studying this, uh, I, I came across some uh, material that pointed out these exact same words are said about Elisha when he's um, about to die. Uh, the the current king at that time in Second Kings chapter thirteen says these exact same words: "My father, my father." Uh, the chariots and horses of, of Israel. And I, I saw there was a suggestion that maybe the way we should be understanding this in English is something along the lines of your prophetic work has been like horses and chariots to Israel. Chariots were sort of military power at this point in, in time. And Prophets represent a a power and and a treasure and and, and I, I think that's interesting to note that that both Elisha and Elijah had those same words um, said to them. But let's let's talk about the conversation Elijah and Elisha have uh, before Elijah is taken up. He, he offers, you know, is there any last thing I can do for you? So what does Elisha ask for, Kevin? He asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Yeah. And uh, when I first started studying for this, I was Googling Elijah and Elisha. And on the Internet, I saw more than one person that noted 
the miracles that Elijah did and the miracles that Elisha did, and they tried to come up with counts of miracles and say, Elijah did eight miracles and Elisha did 16 miracles. Uh, They didn't all have the same number of miracles. It's kind of hard to know, you know, which ones to count as as one miracle or two miracles or three miracles. I'm not sure that's really what this is about. I, I do think it's it's showing Elisha's devotion, his enthusiasm. Uh, you know, you were saying earlier about you know when Elijah first called him and he sacrificed his oxen, um, and and we see that same spirit here. Um, and you, the reference to Elijah's spirit, it, it doesn't say literally Holy Spirit. I think it's fair though to uh, to read this as Elijah had the Holy Spirit and uh, Elisha was looking for that. It's it's good for us uh, to think about that in terms of the new covenant and to remember that we've all been uh, given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And and so that's, that's something uh, that we shouldn't take uh, for granted. But the thing that I came across in studying about this that uh, seems really significant to me is the idea of inheritance and firstborn in uh, in Jewish culture in Bible times. The firstborn child was the main heir, and they would get a double portion of the inheritance. So. By asking for the double portion, Elisha is really looking for being the heir uh, to Elijah. I'm sure he's seen uh, how hard Elijah's work is, and yet he he still uh, wants to do that. So so he's he's quite determined. So now Elijah's gone. We we read up to. Uh, He's he's gone up to heaven. Elisha rends his his garment, uh, showing his grief. Let's see what happens next. So, uh, Kevin, could you read thirteen through eighteen, please? Sure. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, "Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah?" And when he had struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. And they said to him, Behold now, there are with your servants fifty strong men. Please let them go and seek your master. It may be that the spirit of the Lord has called him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, you shall not send. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send. They sent, therefore, 50 men. And for three days they sought him, but did not find him. And they came back to him while he was staying at Jericho. And he said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? All right. Uh, Elisha has this question at the very start of what you read. He uh what 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 he 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 asked the question where is the lord uh, so kevin why do you think he asks where is the lord i think he wants assurance or um to know that now that elijah's gone that the lord is with him and he kind of does a demonstration almost a you say a repeat of the miracle but does something that he just saw earlier to kind of see okay this is really happening. Let me see if this is this is what's going to happen to me going forward. Yeah, yeah. He he strikes the water with the cloak, uh, and and it's like he's not sure is this really going to work, and it does. Yeah. So, in in everything that you read, uh, are there other things that establish that? Elisha is the legitimate successor to Elijah. Well, I mean, just from the, maybe this is just simple, but I mean, he takes the physical cloak of Elijah. It's almost like the passing of the baton, but now it's it's Elijah's cloak. 
Um, so that's the one thing that, that struck out to me. He's literally picking up something that fell from Elijah and now he's taking his possession and he's using it in the same way that Elijah did. Yeah, people that knew Elijah would see him wearing wearing the cloak and I think that would be meaningful to other people. These, these sons of the prophets recognize him, don't they, here in this situation? Yeah, they bow down to him. Yeah. And even though they go and look for Elijah, you know, that, that kind of verifies that Elijah is really gone. And uh, I think that helps establish Elisha also. So the cloak, you know, is, is what I'm ending up titling this, this lesson. I, originally, I wanted to call it Elijah and the Whirlwind, but I've, I've just come um, – to to think about the cloak and the significance of the cloak, uh, we we've seen the cloak actually uh, several times in First Kings uh, eighteen and nineteen, in uh, lesson three where the the the, comp the competition uh, with the prophets of Baal, and at the end of that. Uh, Elisha, Elijah is racing King Ahab back to Jezreel, so he's running, and it says he he kind of grabs up his cloak as as he's running, and then in the next chapter, uh, when uh, the 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 low whisper of God speaks, Elijah comes out of the cave with with the cloak over him, and and then. Uh, at the time that he calls Elisha, uh, he he puts the cloak on him at that point also. So uh, this isn't the first time actually that the cloak has gone on Elisha's shoulders, but of course here it is uh, to stay. So um, to me, uh, the main message of this chapter is that Elijah's authority and work have been transferred to Elisha. The transfer from Elijah to Elisha is complete. God is with Elisha. The cloak is with Elisha. And, uh, um, you know, I, 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 I kind of have that as a takeaway also. Elisha's devotion to Elijah, uh, his devotion to serving God. Those are the things uh, that are our big takeaways from me. This, this brings us to the end of Elijah's story, but it doesn't bring us to the end of the chapter. We get a little preview of the work of Elisha, and so let's let's finish out the chapter here. Um, but before I have you read, Kevin, I, I want to go back. Um, this was uh, something we covered in Lesson 4, 1 Kings 19. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came. He's, he's talking to Elijah. Go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meloah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael. And Elisha will put to death any who, any who escape the sword of Jehu. So I would say we should be expecting Elisha to wield a sword. We're looking for at least a figurative sword of judgment. Let's see what actually happens. Uh, so Kevin, could you read uh, from verse 19 uh, through the end of the chapter? Sure. Now the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. He said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. He went up from there to Bethel and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 
42 of the boys. From there, he went on to Mount Carmel. And from there, he returned to Samaria. So does Elisha bring a sort of judgment? What do you think, Kevin? Doesn't appear that way. He actually heals the water, which would seem to be um, something more merciful <laughs> than um, wielding a, a, a sword of judgment. Yeah, that the very first thing he does is to bring this uh, this healing of the water from God, a, a miracle, and um, it's it's something of mercy. But there's a second event uh, that occurs here that um, does have kind of a judgment <laughs> to it, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, yes. Yeah, and and this is something uh, that is hard for us uh, to read. I think it's uh, maybe hard to translate accurately as, as well. Um, one thing that's helpful to, to point out is the location. The location is on the road. This is outside of any town. Uh, for people in Bible times, being on the road was a dangerous situation. The, the other thing is the, the age of, of these, I, I think the ESV said small boys, the NIV that I'm looking at says youths. That, that word in Hebrew doesn't have a specific age associated with it. It's used in a number of other verses in the Old Testament. But for example, in Genesis 37, 2, it's used for Joseph, and that same verse says Joseph was 17. So it, it's kind of a different picture. If we think of small boys, you know, we might think of eight, nine, ten-year-olds. But if you think about, okay, there's a group of young men outside of town, and it's more than 40 of them, and, you know, maybe they're 17 or older instead of being eight-year-olds or, <laughs> you know, it kind of kind of gives us a different mental image of the situation that Elisha was in. It's also good to point out that it, Elisha did call a curse down on them, but it was God that brought uh, the bear out uh, against them. So Elisha's commission that we that we read about from 1 Kings 19 it was a commission to bring judgment but he also brings saving and if you if you read more about Elisha's work in the chapters that come after this there's quite a bit of saving type work that that Elijah does and if we think about the types again and look at Jesus Jesus was expected, he was, he's filling the role of the Messiah. He's filling the role of the son of David. He's, he's the king of Israel, and yet it's not the king that people were expecting. He was a different kind of king. He was a king that acted as a servant and a king that acted as a suffering savior. At the same time, this king will come back a second time, and he will be a judge also. Well, this is our final lesson, or that's our final reading. Before we close this down, Kevin, let's, let's just take a minute to think back overall over the course of these lessons. Um, do you have any thoughts about What's your favorite Elijah story at this point? Well, given that I am getting a little thin up top, I do kind of like the story with the bears. Um, but, <laughs> but I I still like the um, what you call it, the competition. I think that is just a really it's a great story, the way it's told and the outcome and. Um, you know, there's there's great movies about the Bible. I, I always think about the Ten Commandments. I mean, that right there, that whole scene would be a magnificent scene in a movie. Yeah, I would say I I really like the next chapter, uh, even though it's 
Elisha at his low point, the, the I just think it's really cool how God sends the wind, the earthquake, and, and the fire, and then it says, and God wasn't in any of those, and then there's the low whisper, and Elijah comes out of the cave and talks to him. Um, it's it's kind of mysterious, uh, but I I just think it's neat, and I really think it it demonstrates uh, God's love for Elijah and and the way the way he cares for him and treats him there. So uh, then my next question for you: What's your biggest aha or wow kind of thing? Um, from this study. I hope, I hope you had something that was sort of a, an aha moment. Well, I mean, truth be told, everyone watching, I know you've sent these questions to me um, through this week, and I've been thinking about it, and, and every day I seem to have a different answer. But the one that, that really strikes to me is kind of talked about today with Elisha and when he's called originally, and his excitement or devotion um, basically not really taking the time to get his affairs in order. He says bye to his mom and dad. Um, so I guess you could say he got that in order. And then the way he got his affairs in order was he just got rid of everything that was um, tethering him to earthly gain and income, burned it, sacrificed it, and then followed Elijah. So, um, you know, that's, that's a wow to me. You know, yeah. not, not, on, not on his time, but on the time when he's called, he, he responds immediately. That that's really powerful. Um, I I think for me I, I've I've just kind of gotten into this study of types and seeing the the way that God tells stories with history and the way that um, these three pairs of people connect to the overall story of God solving the problem of mankind's sinfulness. Uh, and then finally, uh, is there an application that you're thinking about as as we leave behind this study, kind of personal application that you're willing to share with us? Yeah, so I've, I've been thinking a lot about Naboth. And, you know, even though he's a minor character, um, I'll give you some background. I did a, a study with the high school and middle school, I don't know, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, and it was the minor characters of the New Testament. And some of these characters only have a few sentences or a paragraph, but they were very interesting. And, you know, there's a reason why they're in the Bible. And so that kind of opened my eyes to any new, call them minor characters. And Naboth is just, you know, wrong guy, wrong place, wrong time. And what happens to him is very unfortunate. But what I'm taking from him, and I've gone over this a few times now, is when he's asked why he won't sell the land or, or give up his vineyard, he just doesn't say, I don't want to. You know, we're told he gives the reason, and the reason is because really it belongs to the Lord. It's an inheritance from my fathers who received it from God. And, you know, that statement led to his death or the action of not selling it. And so I'm just wondering, you know, in my own life, we... We sometimes will give answers that are based on our faith or our morals. And we tell people, no, I don't want to do that. But we don't tell them why or we don't really stand up for what we believe in. We just, you know, give it the easy answer to get us out of a certain situation or don't take the opportunity to share um, our, our true values and our true beliefs. And I just found this very insightful from Naboth that he doesn't have to give that piece of information, but he does. And so I've been thinking about him lately and, you know, we know that God cares about him and, and God does in the end um, enact justice for him on what he does to Ahab. So, you know, God took care of the situation, although Naboth was um, unfairly killed. He stood up for God and um, shared his reasons. And um, in the end, God was in control and, and, and took care of that. So I've just been wrestling with that and thinking about that. and. Um, you know, what can I take from someone who is in that situation? And can I be more like Naboth when someone asks me something? And do I feel confident and, and am I able to give the type of answer that I should give to someone? So that's something that I've been thinking about now for a while with the study. 
That's really neat. I appreciate you sharing that. I uh, hadn't really, you know, thought about the angle of Naboth, uh, and so I'm glad you uh, brought that out. I I was thinking along the lines of courage as well, but, um, you know, not as imaginatively. I was just kind of thinking of Elijah, and, uh, you know, there's the obvious things of the courage that he had in confronting people, but I would say also his courage in praying bold prayers. And and there's there's different ways that we can show courage. I am thinking about some of the things uh, our Elisha has said about being a peacemaker, and being a peacemaker is something uh, that requires courage. Okay, well, this really brings us to the end. As we've said in every lesson, our prayer is that you've been blessed and encouraged by your time studying God's Word with us. We we hope you would take time to dig deeper in this. Uh, we, we put all the scripture references into the YouTube description uh, for these videos. If there's something we've said that generated questions or there's any other way we can serve you, we'd encourage you to reach out to us through the Raleigh Church of Christ website or Facebook page. And thanks for watching.